Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Today's episode is Jung's Commentary on the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, with Thomas Patrick Lavin, Ph.D. This episode is the first session of a four-part series. Using as a focal point Jung's private notes from his 1939 to 1940 lectures on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, Dr. Thomas Patrick Lavin discusses the role of imaginal work in the quest for spiritual and psychological growth. The spiritual exercises is viewed as an initiation rite in which a Christian form of active imagination is presented. It was recorded in 1988. The series is divided into the following four topics. Seeing Jung and Ignatius in their historical contexts, active imagination and the Ignatian methods of prayer, the anima Christi and the fundamentum, and finally Ignatius the psychologist and Jung the theologian. Thomas Patrick Lavin, PhD, is a Zurich-trained Jungian analyst who holds a PhD in clinical psychology and a PhD in theology. He was formerly chief clinical psychologist for the U.S. Army in Europe and is a founding member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. He is in private practice in Wilmette, Illinois, and consults internationally on typology, spirituality, and addictions. And we'll have links in the show notes for the complete series and for other seminars by Dr. Lavin. Ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I would like to thank you for coming to these series of lectures and for your interest. Our topic during the next four weeks is the role of imaging in the spiritual life. From June 16th, 1939 until June 22, 1940 Carl Gustav Jung gave a series of 21 lectures at the Swiss Polytechnic Institute in Zurich. It is these lectures of, of Jung on the Ignatian exercises or the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius that forms the topic of the next four lectures. And so the title is The Role of Imaging or the Use of Images in the Spiritual Life. And the subtitle would be Carl Gustav Jung's commentary on the Ignatian exercises. Let me first give you an overview of those things which I would like to share with you during the next four weeks. The title of this evening's lecture is Seeing Jung and Ignatius in Their Historical Context. And my question here would be, were Ignatius and Jung both psychotics who turned out all right? In the second lecture, the title is Active Imagination and the Ignatian Methods of Prayer. And my question is, does God speak only to TV evangelists? The third lecture is entitled The Anima Christi and the Fundamentum, Two Major Prayers of Ignatius and Understandings of Ignatius in his exercises. So lecture three will talk about the Anima Christi and the Fundamentum or the Basic Principles. And my question is, are we to become Christ or imitate Christ or what? 
And f the fourth and final lecture is entitled Ignatius the Psychologist and Jung the Theologian. And in this lecture, there will be some questions that will be put forward regarding the differences between a theological and a psychological attitude towards religious experience. And my question might be phrased for the fourth lecture, why can't the theologians and the psychologists be friends? And so this, I hope, will serve to give you an overview of the areas that I would like to discuss with you, share with you, during the next four weeks as we pursue and try to understand a little bit better Jung's commentary on the Ignatian exercises. I realize that I am talking to a heterogeneous group. There are some of you who know a lot about Jung and active imagination, but very little about Ignatius of Loyola. There are others of you that know a lot about Ignatius and the exercises, but not that much about the person, Carl Gustav Jung, and his approach to religious experience, which he calls active imagination. And so consequently, you may find that in these lectures, I may be repeating some facts that you already know. Uh, and for that, I apologize. Some Jungians will hear quotes about Jung that they've probably given in lectures themselves to other people. There will be men and women who have given retreats along the lines of the guidance of St. Ignatius who will be hearing me give the history of the exercises or history of St. Ignatius and this is something they've done every year of their lives for 40 years and I'm sorry if it uh, if it might seem a bit boring to you. However, uh, when you're dealing with a mixed group of people, I feel it's best not to assume things. Uh, better to go back to basics, better to share basic ideas, uh, so that one or another group is not really left out. There, uh, this morning when I was shaving, uh, and forced to look at my own persona. I had to laugh because I said, uh, what are you going to do today? And I said, you're going to, well, one of the things in the evening is you're going to go to Loyola University and lecture to men and women uh, about the exercises of St. Ignatius. And I thought, my God, uh, <laughs> what hubris. You're going to Loyola to lecture to Jesuits about the psychological aspects of the exercises. Uh, and that only, to me, uh, confirms the adage that I made up that Jungian analysts are people who walk in blithely or blindly to places where uh, angels and drunks fear to tread. <laughs> but uh, it is with a great deal of gratitude to members of the Society of Jesus uh, that I indeed stand before you to give these lectures. I have been very blessed and graced and pushed by members of the Society of Jesus uh, for the last 30 years. And for the last 30 years, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius uh, have been very important to me. 
I would also like, to, in, the, in the very beginning, to give thanks where thanks are due to several people that have helped me better understand the topic that we are going to enter into, hopefully more deeply, in the next four weeks. They are people like Marie-Louise von Franz, who helped me understand active imagination, Barbara Hanna also has been very important in her work and her lectures in my understanding of active imagination. Uh, Jesuits like uh, Hugo Rana, Ro Bob Doran, who is up in Toronto, Fred Maples, who is the first Jesuit to become a Jungian analyst, I thank them for their helping me understand different dimensions of the exercises of Ignatius that I did not see before. I would also like to thank a Jungian colleague of mine, Wolfgang Gigerich. Wolfgang Gigerich is an analyst in Stuttgart and has written and worked on a psychological understanding of the Ignatian exercises. And I plan actually in the fourth and final lecture to counterpoint, if you will, the work of Bob Duran and Wolfgang Gigerich uh, in terms of their differing understandings of religious experience and the spiritual exercises. Or you have a Jungian analyst misunderstanding, I, fi I think, Ignatius and a, a Jesuit scholar and fine person, uh, Bob Duran, uh, who understands the exercises but does not totally understand Jung's approach to those exercises in these lectures that he gave in 1939 and in 1940. And so I would like to, to thank these people who've helped me. I would also like to thank some of my patients who have been members not only of the Society of Jesus but other religious orders of men and women who've been able to help me understand the importance of the exercises in their lives, in their own formation, in the importance of the use of imagery in their own spiritual life, in their coming to terms with the divine, both inside and outside. And so I would like to thank also my patients uh, who've been very important. My purpose is to offer you Jung's commentary on the work of Ignatius of Loyola. I cannot offer you uh, all of these 153 pages of, or more than that actually, um, 202 pages, I think, uh, of insight. But it is my hope to take the most salient points of this monograph of Jung, which has not been published. Uh, it was Jung's request that uh, this, these series of monographs not be published initially, although I do believe that they will be published in the future, edited and published in the future. Consequently, the only ones today or right now who have access to these monographs, these 21 lectures, are Jungian analysts. Only a small portion has ever been published. And therefore, it's my hope to be able to share some of these insights of Jung so that we can really understand both Jung, where Jung and Ignatius come together, and they do in so very many places, and where they're disparate as they approach 
the symbolic or the spiritual life. I would like to begin tonight's lecture with two quotes. The first quote is perhaps too often quoted. It is from the philosopher George Santayana, and I'm sure many of you know it. The quote is, those who do not know history are condemned to repeat it. It seems to me that it is imperative that Jung and Ignatius and the spiritual exercises be seen in an historical context. Both Jung and Ignatius did and said things and wrote things which are indefensible in 1988. We just cannot defend some of these statements of Jung and some of these statements of Ignatius in terms of what we know today of contempor in contemporary psychology and contemporary theology. I also think that contemporary psychologists and theologians might find some of the behavior, not only the statements, the written statements, but some of the behaviors of both Jung and Ignatius uh, to be somewhat bizarre. I think people would have difficulty with some of the behavior that Ignatius exhibited at Manresa during the time of his conversion. And there's no question that uh, contemporary psychologists have written about Jung between the years 1912 and 1921, right after his break with Sigmund Freud. They don't really consider some of Jung's playing in the sand and building sandcastles as necessarily the epitome of maturity. A lot of the things that Jung did and a lot of the things that Ignatius did in their quest for spiritual meaning, meaning uh, might indeed be termed uh, as psychotic uh, by uh, modern theorists. As a matter of fact, it was about 20, almost exactly 20 years ago I was studying uh, group therapy and group dynamics in Munich under a professor, Eric Klockenhoff. So I was introduced to him, and they said, Professor, Professor, Doctor, Doctor, here is Tom Levin, he's a Jungian. And the man looked at me and went, Ah, oh, der Jung, der Jung. He said, He was the schizophrenic what turned out all right. <laughs> um, in spite of that, we became good friends, Klockenhoff and I. And so, consequently, a, a humorous subtitle to tonight's lecture, or question regarding tonight's lecture, which you find in your syllabus, and that is, were they both psychotics who turned out all right? Uh, because certainly if we look at some of the Manresa experiences, and if we look at some of the experiences of Jung between 1913 and 1921, we see that uh, things were not necessarily in Tao uh, for these gentlemen, okay? But that's the price that has to be paid when you're dealing with things of the spirit. And so, uh, we must see the context of these men and their work, the historical context, if we are not to be frightened by some individual statements or actions of both men. The second quote that I'd like to begin with is a quote from the late Anthony DeMello, uh, who was born in Bombay, was a member of the Society of Jesus, and unfortunately died just within the last year or so. Uh, a master of the spiritual life. He wrote in one of his books entitled The Song of the Bird, 
He has at the very beginning of the book a glossary of two words, which I think is absolutely neat. Okay? And the two words he defines in the Song of the Bird are theology and mysticism. DeMello defines theology thus. Theology is the art of telling stories about the divine, also the art of listening to them. When I read that, I thought, oh my God, you know, where was he in 1960 when I, <laughs> I began theological studies? Uh, anyway, the art of telling stories about the divine and also the art of listening to them. His second definition that he gives us in his two-word glossary is mysticism. And DeMello tells us that mysticism is the art of tasting and feeling in your heart the inner meaning of such stories to the point that they transform you. I'll repeat that again because I think the definition is important and on the money. He says, mysticism is the art of tasting and feeling in your heart the inner meaning of such stories to the point that they transform you. If we see both Jung and Ignatius in their historical context, as I hope to do in these lectures, we'll find that Jung was indeed a mystical psychologist and theologian in the de Mello sense of theologian. That being one who has learned the art of telling stories about the divine and one who also has learned the art of listening to these stories. We will also find that Ignatius of Loyola was also a mystical psychologist and theologian. Both were passionately interested in telling and listening to stories of the divine. And both of them had their own lives and the lives of their followers transformed by these religious experiences. Both Jung and Ignatius had religious experiences which gave their lives a new form. And they knew that these experiences were not for themselves alone, but rather needed to be shared in and with a community because religious experience is not given for the purpose of ego grandiosity, but rather to serve, as Ignatius wrote and Jung lived, to serve a much larger community. The individuation process, as understood by Jung, is not a journey into narcissism, but rather a necessary step in giving a new form to the cosmos. Jung himself, certainly, uh, if this tape were sent to him, and Jung was called, or he heard of himself being called a theologian, uh, Jung would write me a very nasty letter. Uh, because Jung had a, to use his own term, complex about theology. Uh, being the son of a Swiss Reformed pastor and having six uncles who were Swiss Reformed pastors, he had major theological ambivalencies. <laughs> and often uh, someone, a friend of mine who met Jung once, uh, he was waiting uh, to come into the room where Jung was, and um, Jung said, What should I say to this Goldbrunner? I am not a metaphysician, and I am not a theologian. Methinks Jung hath protested much too much. And it really depends, if you really want to look at Jung. Uh, depends on your definition of theology. And my preference goes with Tony DeMello, certainly. 
uh, in terms of the meaning of theology. And so, oh, another thing I think also that is important is that both of these men had indeed the knowledge that their work would transform people. Both of them knew uh, and were bothered by the fact that they had followers. It was sort of a bittersweet reality, especially the second time Ignatius was thrown into jail in 1527, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Not only was Ignatius tossed in the can, but his followers as well, which caused him quite a bit of pain. And so the the idea of followers, the idea of giving back to the community, there's, there's a particular quote uh, where Jung talks about the fact that he, well, he was aware that his psychology is meant to transform lives. And this was after his 80th birthday. Uh, they had three parties at the same time for Jung on his 80th birthday. All three held high up on a hill at the Grand Older Hotel in Zurich. One was given by the psycho Psychological Club, one was public for the Institute, and then there was a private one. Quoting from Barbara Hanna, in Barbara Hanna's biography of Jung, of all the biographies, I think is the most folksy uh, and down to earth. I think it's excellent. Others are quite good, you know, but she lived with the man, uh, not as much as Tony Wolfe and uh, his wife Emma, but certainly was around uh, quite a bit and really gives you a favor of Jung. At any rate, she writes that the morning event, which was open to anyone who had attended lectures at the Institute, was on a large scale, so we expected it to be accordingly dismal. But the opposite was true, for it had one of the most meaningful and healing atmospheres I have ever experienced. Jung stayed for an unusually long time and seemed to drag himself unwillingly away. This is the big institute party. That same evening there was a small dinner party consisting of all the high ups from the many Jungian groups all over the world and from the curatorium and the lecturers at the Zurich Institute. The atmosphere was the exact reverse of the morning. Jung was very pleased to receive a, a bound copy of Mysterium Conjunctionis but on the whole, he looked anything but happy, and he left as early as he could. This contrast struck me so deeply, writes Hannah, that I asked him the next, a few days later about it, as he was engaged in his favorite occupation of chopping wood at Bollingen. Jung said, I'm sure there must have been a great many good spirits there that morning, and I think they mostly belong to people that we don't even know. But you know, those are the people who will carry on my psychology. People who read my books and let me silently change their lives. It will not be carried on by the people on the top, for they mostly give up Jungian psychology and take to prestige psychology instead. I think both Jung and Ignatius were aware of the fact that having followers is indeed a two-edged sword. Okay. Uh, and so <coughs> we are trying to look at Jung, the theologian, and the psychologist. And Ignatius, certainly a psychologist and definitely a theologian. I find it interesting, uh, an article written by Karl Rahner, actually a speech given in Vienna in 1974, October of 74. Uh, reference is the 19th volume of the Center of Ignatius, Ignatian Spirituality. Rahner writes on Ignatius as a theologian for the New Age or a New Age theologian. It's interesting that we're reading in Time magazine and so on about Jung 
as the psychologist of the New Age. And physicists like Fitzhoff, Fitzhoff Capra are making distinctions between Jung and Freud in saying that Freud indeed was a Newtonian psychologist, whereas Jung definitely was very Max Planck quantum oriented whatever New Age means for woe or for weal. But I find this very interesting that Rahner would begin to see the, the importance of the exercises for the New Age, for our time. The importance of Ignatius not only as apostle, but also Ignatius as theologian. He makes a, an excellent point in that case. Um, so, that's what we are about. Do all of you have syllabi or syllabuses, as we say in Chicago? Two don't? Three don't? Okay, for those that don't, let me see if I... Uh, kind of what I've prepared. My question to you right now is, is there anything that you would like specifically discussed from a Jungian point of view or an Ignatian point of view that I may not have mentioned. Yes, please. During the spirit, you mentioned only it's sort of a joke. No, it's not a joke. We we really have to deal with discernment of spirits uh, uh, because it is an, a very important question, uh, which Ignatius really posits uh, over and over again the question, especially in terms of when I'm feeling what he calls either consolation or desolation. Where does this come from? Where does my ecstasy come from? Or where does my depression come from? And how can I find out? And do you know, Ignatius, I think, has a marvelous method a uh, brilliant psychological method in terms of the discernment of spirits. Okay? Uh, and all of this really getting ahead of myself, but all of this really has to do with the acceptance of the belief in spirits. The good spirit and the evil spirit. Okay? But we, we will get into that, definitely, because it's very important. As a matter of fact, there's a lecture that I want to go to myself going on the 27th of July uh, from 7 to 9 o'clock uh, given by my friend Yup von Beck, who is a Jesuit here at Loyola. He's talking on the discernment of spirits at Shield Center where uh, my family and I uh, worship on Sundays. And I called Yup up and I said, this is unfair, I want to go to your lecture. He said, well, I'd like to come to yours. And we both commiserated with one another. And maybe if this thing works and is screwed on right, well, we can change some tape. So the discernment of spirits is extremely important in the spiritual life. Um, and so we'll deal with that. Any other? But that's, I will emphasize that. Yes. Okay. Uh, question is, is it possible to bring in the nature of the self or dynamics of the self somewhere in here? I definitely am going to keep it in the back of my mind. There's one instance in particular where I talk about, and that's going to be next week, I think, when I talk about Ignatian methods of prayer and the dynamism of it, in particular the typology that is there. Okay? There's a whole other issue of the dynamism of the self um, that Ignatius was painfully aware of, uh, and that is when he talks about um, a consolation without previous cause. Okay? So there are different types of consolation that one receives. And the consolation without previous cause, from a Jungian point of view, would indeed be a message from the self, or the God within. But this, this is very important. Also the distinction, and we're going to get to this 
hopefully a bit this evening, um, talking about the, uh, the role of the I and the not I in the spiritual life. In other words, how do we deal with ego dystonic reality? Because indeed, once we start to meditate, contemplate, or pray, we come up against, or should come up against, the other, if we're in, with a capital O. Uh, or, uh, as some people say, Almighty God, G A W D. Okay? Uh, so that one comes up against otherness. There's your question about discernment of spirits. Are there who, where, from where? And they are indeed related. We have to deal with that. Okay, two points. Yes? Um, when you talk about the, the lecture July 27th, the psychologist and the theologian, and I'm interested in the term spirituality and spiritism. Mm -hmm. And uh, will, will that come into that? discussion. In other words, I wonder whether spirituality is something other than both psychology and theology. I think that spirituality is indeed the tertium quid that rises out of both coming together. But Jung called it the symbolic life. In volume 18 of the collected works, he has an exquisite monograph, and the, the whole volume is named after this monograph, and it's called The Symbolic Life. Uh, I think that's how he would understand spirituality, uh, and I would see him being against any ism, being a good Swiss, okay? Uh, spiritualism, Catholicism, Protestantism, uh, because he had a phobia with regard to collectives. But we can, if I understand you right, is there something that flows out of the meaning, meeting place of psychology and theology that we can call spirituality? And if there is, what is it? Or how can we circumambulate it? How can we walk around it? Okay. Okay. Yes. You said you were going to talk about psychology in terms of Ignatian prayer. I've been debating with myself I mean, for years over the psychology when I read either Ignatius or Neo. And, uh, I went, and, and listening to the other questions regarding the self and other things, it just seems like this is a large, it's a large issue for me. I wonder if you're going to get into it more than that or not. Um, see if I can. See if I can. Uh, it is a very large issue. Um, and there's been, I think, in the history of many of us, uh, something I lectured on here quite uh, a while ago, I think last year, year before. Uh, we're all victims of ecclesiogenic neuroses. Uh, in that we were told that there was a way to pray or a way to, there's our way and the wrong way, uh, and so on. Uh, often enough, there was a thinking function domination or tyranny uh, so that feeling function people felt uh, that they didn't measure up enough or weren't holy enough or Jesus didn't love them enough as those who could express it in a syllogism and even pray in syllogy or whatever, okay? And so this, this is a huge area. And, and the way we approach the ineffable is going to be with our own energy, okay? With what we have. Uh, we cannot approach the mystery of the divine in another way. If we do, then we have pseudo-spirituality because it's not authentic. Uh, just as we have pseudo-Jungians and pseudo-Ignatians, if you will. The people get so caught up in technique and technology that they lose the spirit or the quest or what they're about. 
And one of the things here that is, is very important is indeed a question of letting the retreatant be where he or she is and first listening to their energy rather than some of the experiences some of us have had in the past. Okay. For right or for wrong, who knows? Okay. I would just like to mention something very brief and personal. A uh, question I asked as I was writing this and preparing this uh, was, why, why am I doing this? Um, why am I talking on the Ignatian exercises? Uh, it's not as big as borderline personalities, I'll have you know. You get invited almost anywhere if you can talk about borderline personalities. But why this? I have a little history myself with the exercises. About 30 years ago, I was in a little town in northern Spain on the 31st of July, and the town's name is Aspathia. I think that's properly pronounced. Um, it happens to be right near the Loyola Castle. And I was there for the feast day of St. Ignatius. And um, when I was there, and there was also a wonderful ordination on that day and procession through the streets. I don't know whether I was more interested in watching the procession of the Ordnandi or the wonderful senoras and senoritas who were throwing roses on them from the balconies as they were going down the street. And when I was there, I picked up this book uh, called The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius. I figured when in Rome or Aspathia, uh, then do what they do. Lewis Poole's translation um, which has withstood the test of time. That was 30 years ago. Um, there has never been a year in the past, around 30 years ago, in the past 30 years, that I have not gone back to this book in times of, as Ignatius would put it, consolation or desolation. Uh, something, a book that has been very important to me all my life. Um, and I think about this personally. Um, I, we were invited after the procession and after a wonderful, sumptuous banquet uh, 30 years ago in July to stay the night and to spend some time with some of these people. And uh, unfortunately, I had a date with a girl from Shreveport, Louisiana, in Paris the next day on the 1st of August, and I've often wondered what would happen had I stayed uh, rather than off to Paris. Anyway, it started my interest, uh, if not absorption, started about 30 years ago. And I'm reminded of a, a book that was just out recently called Inside AA, uh, an author by the name of Robert Robertson. Quote someone, talking about the AA Fellowship, and says, the person says, I came into AA to save my ass, and I found my soul was attached to it. <laughs> um, well, I've had three years of undergraduate uh, Jesuit education, and I've had nine years of graduate education uh, under the kind and loving hands, sometimes, sometimes not, of the members of the Society of Jesus. And I can really say that there, there really hasn't been a time in my life in the past 30 years when there hasn't been some Jesuit or Jesuit-educated person who hasn't been present either to save my ass or save my soul or do both at the same time. Um, and I mean that um, ass rather academically. Uh, both at the University of Innsbruck, uh, which I'm a graduate and a Jesuit institution, and at St. Mary Lake Seminary at Mundelein, uh, where the Jesuits, at least in my time, were the major teachers. Um, and so this book, 
spiritual exercises has been something that's been with me for quite some time. Now, when I graduated from the university, well, actually from uh, the Jung Institute in 1975, I was informed that one of the things someone could get once you had a diploma was not a free bus ticket on the Zurich uh, bus or tram, but copies of modern psychology, or the ETH lectures of Jung. Three volumes. ETH, um, the Eigenossische Technische Hochschule, or the Swiss Polytechnic University. That's where Jung was professor. That's where he talked to engineers and physicists and what have you about the spiritual exercises of Loyola. Okay? That was his audience. Now, these have never been published. These are private, and when I got them, I had to sign that I would never lend them, quote them, so on and so forth. Um, well, uh, I had my fingers crossed when I signed it. Uh, and insofar as I can't write about this yet, uh, I, I really wanted, I was thrilled when I looked at this for the first time in 75 and said, oh my God, there are 21 lectures that Jung has given about the spiritual exercises. I didn't know that. And I don't know that many did know that. Um, and so I said, someday I'd like to share these insights with people. Well, it's 12 years since we, my family and I have returned uh, from Europe, and I guess it's about time I may be ready uh, to share some of these things. By the way, I called uh, William McGuire, who is the editor of the Collected Works of Jung, and I said, when are these things going to be published? You know, the the A.T. Ha lectures. And he said, no one has plans to publish them at all. And I said, to whom do I write the nasty letter? And he told me, and I did, because I think this information should be given uh, to uh, really people who are students of the spiritual life, not necessarily Ignatian scholars. And they should be talked about and discussed in a historical context. So consequently, because you can't read it yourself, uh, unless under the table, uh, this is one of the reasons for my giving these lectures. Also to share, I think, some very important soul material, and lastly, to show a small token of gratitude to the society who has destined to save me in my life in so many ways. Um, so that's a bit of the personal reason for going into the exercises. We should have a bit of a break for those that need it for about 10 minutes. First, I'd like to talk a bit about well, actually the topic of this course, the role of imagining in the spiritual life. Um, this whole topic, I think, is absolutely pivotal. In other words, what role does the use of images, imagining, play? in the spiritual life. And why is this important? Um, a book that I can suggest with regard to imagery in general is a book by Samuels and Samuels called Seeing with the Mind's Eye. Okay, it's, it's, it's an overview of the use of imagery uh, for healing, uh, Receiving images, imagery in psychology, imagery in healing, imagery in religion. It's quite good, well illustrated. It's a nice overview. Um, not as deep, let's say, as uh, Campbell's book uh, on imagery, Joseph Campbell's book on imagery, uh, but quite good. Anyway, in this book, they have a whole chapter on the role of images in the spiritual life. 
And Samuels and Samuels say, they come right out with it in the very beginning, and they say the spiritual life is visualization. Okay? Pretty strong statement. And what they're doing, basically, uh, is remembering the work of Eliade, the sacred and the profane. And what they're saying is that we do indeed need a way to approach the sacred, to leave the cares of everyday life that swallow us up, and we need a way of getting to the sacred, which is indeed a different order, a different space, a different place. Okay? That the sacred, this reality, goes beyond our limits of space, time, and causality. It's a space that deals with paradoxes, where things are themselves, but they're not themselves. Okay? It's a space that deals with the absolute unknowable one, as the Godhead is called in some religions, with eternity, with powers. The sacred viewpoint requires a totally different way of looking at the world than the profane or secular viewpoint. Okay? And so to understand that we are dealing with in the spiritual life, we're dealing at least in the beginning with a way of initiation, a way of coming to terms with the imaginal, a way of coming to terms with the image, with the metaphor, with that aspect of our life. And other authors will talk about the spiritual life in terms of, and here I'm thinking of uh, Campbell, The Inner Reaches of Outer Space uh, was his last book. Uh, the Power of Myth that some of you saw on PBS um, uh, was not really his last book. The, the culmination of what he wanted to say of a life's work of dealing with mythology, I think you find in the inner reaches of outer space. And in that book, he talks about religion being a metaphor and metaphor leading to religious experience. I know there are probably three dozen uh, Greek scholars in the audience, but for that one person that isn't, uh, the word metaphor coming from metapherein, to help us to bear, literally bear with, okay, to carry the burden. Okay? And so a metaphorical, a symbolic look at reality helps us to bear with, if not stand over and above, the woe and wheel of everyday life. And so in order to do this, there are indeed rites of initiation. One has to be pulled out of the profane, so to speak, and this is what was done in primitive and is being done in primitive societies. If you read Eliade, the rites and symbols of initiation. Okay, so the first one I... Second one, rites and symbols of initiation. He tells the story of how young men in Africa and in other places are first frightened and their mothers frightened that the initiators come in with bull roars, with whips, slashing and screaming, and go into the tent of the mother and the child and take the neophyte out with screaming and yelling and violence and so on. Okay. One must be ripped out of the mother world okay. in order to learn the totems and taboos of the tribe. And the mother at that particular time cries, cries a special type of keening uh, that is reserved for death of a relative. Because when that young man comes back across the river, after a year or so of rites of initiation, indeed, the boy will be dead. And the new person, because of the spiritual information, 
uh, that he has received as a lived experience, not dogma, as a lived experience will be a transformative thing. A new person, there will be a totally new person sociologically that comes back across the river and comes back into the tribe. And so a rite of initiation is indeed something which is very frightening to all of us, especially those of us who are puer eterni, our eternal adolescents. We want to stay in some kind of tent, uh, some kind of mother world. Uh, don't really care to go out and have our teeth pushed in by people who they who say are initiating us into a greater life. Okay? And this is both for the male and the female. And so, in order to learn to see with new eyes, we have to be initiated. And I would suggest to you that there is indeed an archetype of initiation, archetype being basic human pattern of behavior that is cross-cultural and transtemporal, and that the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola fall right into that pattern, okay, into the archetype of initiation. Um, we need not only to be initiated into the life of the spirit, but we also need to find a way back to the world of matter. Because they give drugs called, well, things like Thorazine to people who are really into the world of spirit and spirits. It's a dangerous thing. Okay? As both Jung and Ignatius point out, the danger of this journey. Okay. Yeah, you could. You could. That'd be a whole other series of. Or you could be torn apart by the matriarchy, and run for cover to the patriarchy. It all depends on the context of your own family of origin. Uh, as well as your ethnic culture. I'm thinking in terms of you using matter in terms of mother, so they heard you do that before, mm-hmm. and then father being the patriarchal idea. Okay. The that is one prism through which to look at this very complex reality. But it's not the only one. Certainly valid. Certainly valid. So that we need, uh, I guess we could say that man is a meeting place of matter and spirit, that humankind is indeed the place where matter and spirit come together, and that we have a need to make spirit matter and to see the divine spark at the core of our material universe. (coughs) It's a both end. So that we don't get caught in one or another side. People who live too much a spiritual life live no life. People who are only in the world of matter are equally open to being devoured by it. And so we need a bridge so that we can walk to one side and come back. This bridge Jung called the transcendent function. That is that function by which we can recognize symbol, see symbolically, live symbolically. The bridge by which we can travel between matter and spirit and bring them together in our lives. In order to do that, we need images. We need images in order to be able to visualize and to have symbols. Jung said, Transcendent function, I often refer to it as the transitional function, to go from one situs or one place to another. We need symbol to move. Symbol, as you remember, being defined and distinguished from sign, symbol being the visible manifestation of an unknown reality. 
as opposed to sign which is a visible manifestation of a known reality. A stop sign is a visible manifestation of a known reality or a stoplight. A symbol, on the other hand, will always be mysterious. We will never totally understand what a symbol means in its entirety because at the very core of the symbol is mystery. A visible manifestation of an essentially unknown reality. One might even say divine reality. Symbolane, even from the etymology of the word, to bring together. Analane, to take apart. We need ways to bring matter and spirit together. We need a bridge. And for this, for the religions of the world, Throughout all time, for this, we needed rites of initiation in order to accomplish this. Uh, This is not limited, obviously, the, the symbol and the quest for symbolic understanding and living. Uh, is not at all the possession or the right of Christianity. As Jung pointed out many times and others, we find it in the shamans of the world, the so-called shamanic illness, which is a vocation in a way, what Ignatius would call an election. He, He talked about the different types of elections. But one of these would be the shamanic way of being initiated. Not totally different from how the Society of Jesus has used the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Indeed. Okay. Another way is the way of the tantric yoga. Okay. Of the use of symbol. Does anyone know what the name tantric means originally? Okay. It means to expand knowledge through the use of visualization. We can see this also, this use of sign and symbol and metaphor in the spirituality of the Jewish tradition and the Kabbalistic tradition. Okay, starting in Spain in the 1200s, okay, before Ignatius even, okay, we see this. We can see this also this use of sign and symbol and metaphor in the spirituality of the Jewish tradition and the Kabbalistic tradition. Okay, starting in Spain in the 1200s, okay, before Ignatius even, okay, we see this. We also see, and I'm wondering about this, and I didn't pick this up in Jung's work, we also see a book being written uh, and you'll find it in the Incriticum Patristicorum, a book written by Ignatius of Antioch around 150 A.D. called The Spiritual Exercises. Now, what I'm wondering is, when Ignatius had his conversion, and we'll get to that, he got the life of Christ, and we know who wrote that, but he also got the lives of the saints. And I'm just wondering if old Ignatius of Loyola didn't perhaps read uh, a little bit about his namesake, Ignatius of Antioch, who indeed, in the first century after Christ, had spiritual exercises. Who knows? I certainly don't. So it's part... This, this imaging is, these spiritual exercises are part of traditions, of all religious traditions, of all times. They are indeed the way into the divine and the way back from the divine. I think the moving back and forth is very important, okay? Uh, 
No one wants to be an airhead or psychotic for Jesus or Buddha or anybody else. Okay? The common experience, says Eliade, in Rites and symbol, Symbols of Initiation, is that the initiand finds out through these exercises, which involve both body and spirit, that I am more than I. Okay? Just as Ignatius at the end of his, towards the end, anyway, uh, of his time at Manresa, the time, uh, his year of uh, living like a bum, I guess, hippie for Jesus, I don't know, how, you'd, how someone who was uptight Christian would look at that today. He was sitting by a river very much like Buddha sat under the tree. And he had an experience, he writes, uh, of illumination that went beyond the scriptures. A feeling of complete knowledge. Uh, Jung talks about it as a pleroma or fullness feeling. A real gnosis Okay, that move beyond pistis or faith, says Jung. Okay. In other words, the not I experience that there is more to me than me. In Jungian psychology, we would say that uh, Ignatius found that the e his own ego was only a part of his self and not all of the self. This is an experience that anyone in any religious tradition comes to. The experience of illumination, the experience of light. Okay? And here we could talk about Ignatius's vision of the sun okay? and seeing Christ as the sun, the sun being all cultures, all times, symbol of the self. So Christ as, as Erdinger in his book Ego and Archetype talks about Christ as a paradigm of the self for Ignatius of Loyola. How does this come? It comes through the image. Okay. Um, and so we have to see, the question we ask ourselves is, or many times is, oh my God, have I gone too far with this stuff? What do I do with this not I? I am not in control. We have this feeling. Okay? Ignatius certainly was not in control. Okay? When for months he didn't shave or clean or wash his clothes and he was suicidal, we know, once from his autobiography. Another time he was told by his spiritual director, enough with the fasting already. You're killing yourself. Okay? To the point that around this time, I'm getting ahead of myself, what the hell is it? Around this time is when Ignatius had the vision of the serpent. Okay? First vision of the serpent, which was a source of consolation. Later vision towards the end of his Manresa time, if I remember correctly, his vision of the serpent next to the cross. And the serpent did not have the brilliance which it had in an earlier vision. Jung talks at length about the vision of the serpent. And in the beginning, the serpent, okay, and what is the serpent? Uh, you know, do you have three days uh, as a symbol? Okay. The serpent... Jung saw, anyway, as really a sign of the instincts, you know, the serpent and the chakras, okay? And so seeing the serpent really as a sign of healing, and Ignatius was doing harm to his instinctual, physical, material side. Consequently, a compensatory image of a divine 
serpent. In other words, to see matter, his matter, his instinctual side, as something containing a spark of the divine. And therefore, Ignatius was not to destroy himself with the fasting that he had, and scourging that he had been doing, uh, which comes out of the devotee tradition, um, with which Ignatius was familiar. Okay, we still have the flagellistas. Uh, in New Mexico and in Mexico and in Spain. Okay. This duality where matter has got to be evil and only spirit is good and so you starve the hell or beat the hell out of matter. But then, with or without a spiritual director, this is interesting, or an analyst, <laughs> Psyche speaks in a very strong and poignant way and says, no, you may not. You are going against the very path of initiation. So you don't always, you know, who was, who was Jung's analyst? Uh, who was Ignatius's retreat master in the cave at Manresa? The big retreat master, okay? <laughs> or the big analyst, if you would. All right. And so we can get into a situation where we're dealing with ego dystonic reality and it can be frightening and destructive as well as consoling, illuminating, and uplifting. There we come to a discernment of spirits. There we come to the need of a guide there we come to the need of a community okay, at different periods in one's growth. If we think that we can do it alone, that we can deal with the not I or the self all by ourselves, we're not really aware of the traditions deep within ourselves and deep within the history of humankind. And so imagery, I would posit, is an extremely important part of the spiritual life. The use of imagery, the use of vision and visions, the experience of spirits, both positive and negative, are found in all cultures. They're found in everyone's quest. And it is not wise to go always alone nor is it wise to be always directed. In true Jungian fashion, I feel that we need to have a both end to find our own way in this regard. Which leads us then to what I would call the Asclepian connection. Uh, The whole rites of, uh, of initiation as experienced in the spiritual exercises are part of a pattern. The pattern is we know uh, in our own Greco-Roman culture can be traced definitely back to the cult of Asclepius in Greece. Um, in this cult of Asclepius, and you all remember Asclepius with his caduceus and so on, the snake, by the way, okay, as a sign of healing, which Ignatius got as a gift from his self, from his God, within, by the way, without benefit of clergy. Um, this snake, this healing rite of Asclepius, demanded an incubation. I would say what I'm, my point here is, is basically in, in plain Chicagoese, um, the root of the retreat movement is indeed in Western tradition, the Asclepian tradition of incubation. Okay. Why someone went to the Asclepian temple at Epidaurus or went to the island of Kos 
was because they were not switching cultural terms in their own Tao. Okay? They were unbalanced, which is the same word that we use for neurosis. Now, if you really read all the books on neurosis, you get, uh, or some of them anyway, you come up with the idea of, you know, what these people are talking about is a lack of balance. Depressive neurosis, anxiety neurosis, phobic neuroses, obsessive-compulsive neuroses. These people have a real balance problem. Okay? They've lost it. They've lost their way. And so too in ancient Greece, people were either physically or psychologically ill. One of the ways of being cured was that one would go to the shrine of Asclepius to be healed. And one of the major things done in the in the shrine, the Asclepian shrine, was to have an incubatory dream. Jung would later call big dream. Or a dream coming from the collective unconscious. That would be a waypointer, if you will, or a balancer, if you will. Certainly the snake dream of Ignatius of Loyola was indeed a balancing dream. Certainly the dream of Jung as a young man of God shitting on the cathedral at Basel was a balancing dream, if you look at his home of origin. Okay? And so people went to the Asclepian sanctuary. The word, of course, is temenos, holy space, sacred space to incubate and to find out what psyche would send them by way of dream or hallucination or what have you, to write them, to heal them. And then they would go back after being healed, after dreaming their dream and having the effects on their body and their psyche, they would go back to where they came from. But once they came back, once they reached the mainland, let's say from Kos, or came back from Epidaurus, they had a new name. They were called by people Therapoites, one who lives in the service of the god Asclepius, the wounded healer. Okay? And so that's where we get our word therapist from. Someone who has been wounded, who has incubated and been initiated in that incubation, and then is, by the very fact of having been healed, is indeed a servant of Asclepius, a servant of the healing God, part of her or his identity. And so when we're looking at the retreat movement, when we're looking at spiritual direction, we are looking at, I believe, the Asclepian connection. Should one go to an analyst or should one go to a spiritual director? Who has more authority? Who owns her or his own shadow and woundedness more for me now? That's the person I'd go to. I don't give a good goddamn about the credentials. Credentials of the soul. But there are those who are both analysts or spiritual director companions who've never been alone on any island in their lives and felt their pain and dealt with the not I and dealt with their own psychosis and dealt with the strangeness of it all. Who wouldn't know Asclepius if he came up and hit him over the head with his caduceus. (laughs) But they've got lots of things after their names in either a theological camp or in a psychological camp. 
but they never sat by a river or under a tree and went, oh! It never happened. And so I think the question of spiritual direction or a psychologist, analyst, da, 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 is a question not of the head but a question of the heart. If you can go to someone and something inside of you goes, <gasps> you may be in the right place. We'll find out after next week's lecture when we talk on the discernment of spirit. No, nah, that's, that's a cheap shot. I think. It's important for those in retreat work, in spiritual companionship, spiritual guidance, and indeed the way of young, you know, to really understand their Asclepian roots. Okay? Reference, sure. Um, it's out of print. Uh, Ancient Incubation and Modern Psychotherapy, written by Professor C.A. Meyer. However, the good news is that it's available in German in the title Der Traum als Medizin and will be published in September in English. It'll be called The Dream as Medicine. And C.A. Meyer, M E I E R, um, we should have it in September. It'll be published in Switzerland. goes through the whole Asclepian rites. tells you about costs and epidaurus and the meaning of the word therapist and all of that good stuff. Where you would also find it is in a book by Meyer that is indeed in print, and it's called Soul and Body. There's a chapter in there on the Asclepian mysteries. Old Santa Ana, if you don't know your history, you may be condemned to repeat it. It's important for those of us who are in healing ministries, who consider ourselves uh, servants of more than our egos, our ego grandiosity, to know our roots. And I would suggest to all of us that we should know a bit about the Asclepian connection, or what I call the Asclepian connection. Let me give you a historical context for the Ignatian exercises. So all of the Jesuits can fall asleep or whatever. Okay. Or those who know the exercises even better than the Jesuits. Ignatius of Loyola, if we were to look at an, into his life, we would see uh, four major periods. Uh, oh, five. Count youth, what the hell. <laughs> first 15 years had him meant something, okay? Then we've got youth, first 15 years. Next 15 years, he's in the military, okay? Next 13 years, he's studying, okay? The next part of his life and final part of his life after his studies, and actually, after his ordination, he was ordained at age 46 on June the 24th, 1537, uh, would be the, I guess, could be called by some authors the apostolic years. Okay? Born in 1491, the next neat thing that happened was he became a page to a relative in a court, the Court of Castile in 1506. By the time he was 25, he graduated, became a knight, real one, horse and all that stuff, okay? <laughs> Fought battles even, sent on diplomatic missions, was he? Yes, he was. A regular General Haig in the making, okay? <laughs> Except he was to be soldier diplomat, and that was his path and that was his course. You do your pageship, you do your knightship, and then you make it big time, Okay? Except that, unfortunately, on the 20th of May, 1521, in that town where they let the bulls loose once a year to run around, Pamplona, Ignatius caught it. Cannonball. Interesting. Ball. Symbol. Anyway. Wounded. Right leg fractured. Left leg hurt a little bit, but not fractured. 
taken home to Mama Loyola, okay? Is there, is looking for a good, racy, nighty novel. Didn't have the Parsifal myth. Not, a, not, a, not around yet, okay? What do they give him? The life of Christ, life of the saints. So, that's what started it, all right. As he was there, convalescing from May the 20th, 1521, until somewhere around the 22nd of February, when he told everybody goodbye, that he was going to give up uh, smoking for good, and uh, that he was going to Montserrat, which he did. A very important part of his background, uh, because there's a whole history, the Abbot Cisternos, a whole history of the spiritual direction. And Jung talks a lot about this in terms of the roots of this whole thing. Montserrat was a place in northeastern Spain where uh, from February 22nd until March 24th, uh, Ignatius decided to, and actually did literally give his sword, sword, put his sword in front of a statue of the Virgin. Okay? Because he decided that he could be as much a knight and as gallant, this is young, fighting his inner enemies as he was in fighting outer enemies. That's part of the conversion experience as Jung sees it. Okay? Um, what indeed happened when he was reading these books, The Life of Christ, when he was reading The Lives of the Saints? Indeed, what happened was a conversion experience was a deep religious experience where someone who was devoted to a career path of being a knight and in the service of his Lord and a certain lady, Ignatius writes, or had written for him, um, the whole idea of chivalry, that he found his soul and he found his love and if there's anything I think that would typify the life of Ignatius of Loyola after the 20th of May, 1521, it was indeed that he had a love affair. He was a man possessed. A man in love. Because people who aren't in love don't act that way. Okay? Totally possessed. From Montserrat, he only remained there a month, he went to Manresa, about 30, 30 miles outside of Barcelona. He spent a year there. I talked about this before. He went through all of these uh, via purgativa, things of scourging and fasting and so on and so forth, uh, which was part of the Spanish tradition at that particular time. Certainly he was told about this at Montserrat, Okay. He did indeed receive many visions at that particular time. And for our interest, it was there that the spiritual exercises began. Okay. Important. It was not his writing of exercises and then his conversion, but rather he's writing from his own experience Okay. about religious experience. And not canned at all. These notes began at the Manresa time. He continued this through his studies, by the way. Uh, finally, they were finished uh, in Paris at the end of his studies in 1535 and approved by Pope Paul III in 1535. 48. By that time, that was the end of the exercises. I mean, they had their form. In the meantime, uh, after his conversion experience, 
he uh, made a trip for a year to the Holy Land, wanted to stay, had plans. The Franciscans said no, he couldn't stay. As Franciscans have said no to Jesuits in other parts of the world, <laughs> um, to the detriment of the church, by and large, but that's one, one uh, uh, Jesuit brainwashed person's opinion. Um, from there he goes to Barcelona. From there he goes to Alcala. From there he goes to Salamanca. In the earlier two places he is imprisoned by the Inquisition two times. Second time at Salamanca with his followers. He's tried by the Inquisition. Okay? You've got to see the context of this guy's life or else you'll read in the exercises rules for thinking with the church and say, you know, I don't believe this stuff. Okay. However, understand the context in Ignatius's life. He was nabbed by the Inquisition twice. Snuck out both times. Okay. Finally decided he went to Paris, studied theology, took little begging trips to get money as Jesuits do from time to time. Uh, Ignatius went to England, uh, went up to Holland from Paris for a little while, came down, which is interesting. Um, spent eight years in Paris from 1528 to 1535. Did indeed receive his MA uh, from the University of Paris. He went to Italy. He's 46 years old. He's finally ordained on June 24th, 1537. He had followers in all of these universities. He also began a group of followers with whom he shared his exercises okay, uh, in Paris, during his eight years in Paris. By the way, it's also important to realize that several times Ignatius shared the experience with women. I know it's hard to believe, but it is true. Okay. Um, it, it's very interesting, Ignatius and women. I'd love to have Ignatius here today on the place of women in the church. No question do I have that he would be for ordination of women, if not bishoping and popising and all of that stuff. Given his decision on whether there should be a female order of Jesuits, he said, no, women should govern women. Men should not govern women. Very interesting. Read the autobiography. Um, he died at age 65 on the 31st of July, his feast day, in 1555. Uh, uh, he had asked to be, not to be director, uh, Father General of his order, when he was in ill health, but he was told to hang on, uh, which he did until his death. Okay. A man of compassion and a man of passion. He was born and died a Basque. Okay? A red-headed Basque at that. They say he had a tinge of red in his fiery Basque hair. And all of his five feet two inches uh, were very powerful because they had been illumined. Okay. He was a man in love. A man who, I think, knew the stories from his own personal experience of the divine. Listened to stories of the divine in others and let them transform him. A mystic. Many years later, just before Hitler broke through Czechoslovakia and then later Poland, 1st of September 1939, we have a series of lectures 
by Carl Gustav Jung on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Jung was roundly criticized during and after these lectures for giving them. People said, what the hell is he talking about some Jesuit saint in Switzerland for when they're not even allowed in the country, when there's a war going on on the other side of the border? What does this have to do if he's so smart? Why doesn't he talk about things that are important? Okay. Instead of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. Or instead of tantric yoga. Okay. Great. The world's on fire. This man is gazing at the navel of religions and saying, you know, we really need to look at sin. Doesn't make any sense. And yet it makes all the sense in the world. Because Jung was there, and I, I talked last summer with my teacher, Professor Meyer, who told me all sorts of stories about how he and Jung were in Berlin in 1935. And they watched the Hitler Jugend. And they spoke to Goebbels. And they saw Himmler. Okay? And they also saw uh, Martin Goering, Hermann's cousin, who was their uh, gastgeber, their host for the Berlin conference. Scared the hell out of you. Couldn't believe it. He knew. Not only his own dreams and dreams of his patients, he saw Hitler. He was ten feet away from Hitler. Okay. And, and he knew at that particular time that there was indeed an initiation process going on, an initiation into the Third Reich, an initiation into Sigmund and Sieglinde, that the Valkyries were raising absolute hell within the Teutonic breast. And he gave, had the courage to give, a series of lectures in 1939 and 1940 on rites of initiation east and west. Tantric yoga, Ignatius of Loyola. Do you see what he was doing? Do you see the context in which this came out? Okay. He said, according to Barbara Hanna, when people gave him a lot of trouble with regard to this, wanted him to, to change his lectures, and Jung talked about, he had, and he talks about it in a book, a commentary on the secret of the golden flower, Jung made this comment. He said, Iskerdis has said there is really only one mortal sin which consists in placing the goal in the creature instead of in God. Okay? And for the man who stands in mortal sin, there is no God, no heaven, no salvation. Jung's comment to that part of the exercises was that according to this, at this time in history, in Western Europe, he said, well, practically all of Western humanity is in mortal sin. Seen as we see it later, uh, as an alteration of fundamental option. And he saw this beginning to grow. Consequently, he had a need and he had a passion. As much as uh, Ignatius had a need and a passion to share the view to those who were hurting in the valley from the mountain, that one could indeed come to terms with religious experience. One could indeed join God and man, matter, spirit, 
one could indeed build a bridge and there was a way, there was a way in the east and there was a way in the west, that we could indeed find a way. The way he called was the path of individual. When one is on the path of individuation, the first thing we have to deal with is shadow. Darkness, evil, all religious traditions. It's like you can't avoid it, shouldn't avoid it. You're irresponsible if you do it. Why, as Jung, why does, does Ignatius spend the whole beginning of the exercises the first week on sin? Isn't it a little top-heavy, you might say, to all this sin business right in the beginning of the first week? Why does he do that? Why do they do that? And Jung gives an answer to that in, in his 13th lecture. He talks about, and I won't, I won't read it to you, but he talks about the necessity of dealing with one's shadow as the first step on the road to illumination. Okay? It's like, I, I can make a Jungian comparison, it's like someone who is a Jungian groupie comes into an anal- analytical relationship and wants to talk about Mysterium Conjunctionis or Ion. Right? Doesn't want to deal with the shadow. Doesn't want to deal with their negative side. Okay. Doesn't want to deal with negative dreams. Wants to talk about the meaning of the symbol of, you know, the great Puba someplace or other. And uniting and young this and young that. Bullshit. And if it's allowed by a director or whomever, you start with the shadow. You start with sin. Uncomfortable icky, shouldn't be done, got to be done, or whoever's doing it is irresponsible. Wait, 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 please, let me finish. Okay? Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the first week. I want to do it now, but we had to put things in historical context. Okay? Uh, But the realization, however one views sin, from a psychological point of view, we're dealing with evil. We can't be spiritual or psychological Pollyannas. We have to deal with the presence of evil within and without as a material and metaphorical reality. You know, Satan, Lucifer, the three sins that Ignatius talks about Okay, in the first week. Okay, The sin of, of Lucifer. Of, of he who carried the light or those of us who would be Lucifer's and illumine others as well as ourselves. The sin of Adam and then our own sins. Psychological terminology, the fundamentum for enlightenment is first dealing with the shadow and any director or, or therapist in the Asclepian sense of that term who doesn't have the courage to deal with their own shadow or the shadows of people coming for help, better get the hell out of the business. We have enough charlatans around. Here's where Ignatius and Jung parallel one another. We begin not with the light, but with the darkness. We feel it, we taste it, we smell it, Okay, as in the Ignatian meditations on hell. And we are aware of the hell of a life we live. live. We do not start grasping for the light. Major failure in direction in many fields. Therefore, the importance of this, and this is what Jung says in his commentary, We find it in the yoga tradition, we find it in the shamanic tradition, we find it in the Kabbalistic tradition. We could go on and on. We may not dismiss the shadow, because if we do, we're inviting the shadow to attack us from the back, as we see in in the love of many religious functionaries, not just Tammy and Jimmy. Okay? 
So that's it for now. I will entertain questions for uh, 9.09 till 9.15. Those of you who have to go, please feel free to do so. I won't be wounded. Yes? But do they? Do they? Do the Course in Miracles people do that? Oh, yes. They use projection. What you see in the other person is in you. I'm Thomas, remember. I've run into these people. It's in you. I've lived with them. They would say, if you see a witch in that person, it's in you. Well. If you see Christ in them, it's in you. Everything is projection to them. Yeah, I know. That's a problem. That can be a problem. You better betcha. Better bet your soul. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I agree with you on that. But I think their egos are so weak, they have to go to the light first and then start dealing with their shadow. And I see a lot of success in that as well. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to be careful that if I've often seen spiritual directors that want to deal with their shadow, they haven't dealt with their own. They sure as hell want to project it onto you. And they want okay. to deal with that sin in you. Sure. So that you're ugly and they're holier than Spiritual you. voyeurism. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think that can be just as demonic. True. There's there's crap all over the place, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, and we all, you, you know. Really deal with the shadow until you, until you detach yourself from the projection. Otherwise, you're, you're always going to color the feeling of the shadow material through some feeling from the conflict. You'll bend it to... to be acceptable rather than seeing it for what it is and then having to accept it. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. There, there can be a, a lot of obsequious mea culpa in, can't there? Yeah. Sure. Also, it's not so much it's sure. a, 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 a the process has to overlap, uh, especially in the shadow material, because it is so deep a part of the human you know, complex is how one experiences it, whether one experiences that as a, a square, as a, a divine child, a, through a foggy glass, or whether one experiences it as an adult. You know, where that complex has got to be broken down. Yep. Yes. For, for Ignatius, you deal with sin always in the relationship. It's always before Christ on the cross. And the mystery of life. Excellent point. And that's Excellent crucial. point. Yep. You don't turn and look at your own gift. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. That's what allows okay. you to enter into the sinfulness. Okay. It's because you know the mystery of being loved as a sin. Yes. Excellent, excellent point. The point is, it's not, it's not done. This whole question of dealing with the shadow, that it's not done in a vacuum. Okay, that there is a whole teleology, a whole purpose, a whole directedness. It's not psychological or spiritual masochism, but rather we're dealing with our own shadow as we look or gaze at our understanding of an image of the self. In the case of Ignatius and the Christian, Christ on the cross. Christ loving. And it is to that hero that we express our lack of being hero and heroine. And loving you with the shadow. With. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not in spite. Oh, you know. Oh, Felix culpa, as we used to say in that old language on Good Friday. Okay? 
uh, that there is a whole there's a whole dimension of the shadow if you look into into and we can't go into this much but uh, coyote was this kind of trickster shadow figure uh, and in many uh, Indian myths coyote is killed for some of the stuff that he does and he's absolutely heinous but then the sky gods say no 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 we have to make coyote alive again you know we know he did bad things but we need coyote because coyote belongs on the earth so they breathe life back into coyote again and he's off doing his things again okay? the gods do not tolerate the existence of the world without a shadow we all have our coyotes okay we all have our birds yeah. there's a great German saying and it, it goes and I'll, I'll close with this they say jeder hat ein Vogel im Kopf aber der der nicht weiß hat ein Adler we all have a little bird in the head but those that don't know they have a bird in the head have an eagle <laughs> So it goes with our shadow. Thank you for coming tonight. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.